What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Christ often taught in parables. Parables, as Pastor John describes them, are nothing but riddles, stories without meaning for the unbeliever. But for the believer, they are Jesus' theology of salvation in stories. One familiar parable is where we find ourselves today. So grab your Bible and open to Mark 4 as Pastor John takes us through the parable of the sower. Well, I'm going to ask you to turn back to Mark chapter 4. And this is a kind of a Magna Carta on the growth of the kingdom, a kind of a Magna Carta on how to do evangelism. Now to begin with, I want you to look at verse 26. That's where I want to start. It's the next to the last of the parables here. And it only appears in Mark, verses 26 to 29. And among these parables, which he is using to explain the nature of his kingdom and how it grows, he was saying this, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil, and he goes to bed at night and gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows, how he himself does not know. The kingdom of God is what he's talking about. The kingdom of God, meaning the sphere of salvation, the realm of salvation over which the Lord rules in the hearts of believers. You have to understand it this way. It's like a man who casts seed upon the soil and then goes to bed and gets up and goes to bed and gets up and the days and the nights pass and the seed sprouts and grows how he himself does not know. Now to start with, seed itself is paradoxical. Paradoxical in the fact that a seed is very small and appears dead. In fact, it has to decompose to give life. That's that's only explainable by divine design. So the seed is paradoxical. It's small. It's seemingly dead, dormant. But out of it comes a, a life that flourishes and grows in a prolific way. So is the wonder of the gospel. The gospel is hidden in small truths, small realities, small doctrines, but it breaks out into massive production of spiritual life. The seed dies and gives life, but no farmer has anything to do with that process. Farmer doesn't do anything. Can't make a seed die, can't make a seed grow, can't make a seed produce life, can't make a seed produce more life. The only human act is to plant and go to sleep while the crop mysteriously grows. All the forces of life are beyond the man, beyond the farmer. Even the best farmer. So it's foundational to all who engage in gospel ministry to understand this. No human being, no human strategy, no human technique can produce any spiritual life. No matter how persuasive you might be, how clever, how good your illustrations might be, how culturally savvy you might be, 
no matter how you may structure the environment to make people feel like they're at home in the world, nothing that a human being does plays any role in spiritual life and growth. You can't produce the new birth. You can't cause spiritual growth. It's a divine work. We're saved by grace through faith, but that's not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. All the farmer can do is show up in verse 29 when it's time to harvest. He has no role to play as the crop grows by itself, first the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. No farmer give, gives life. No farmer energizes cell division, multiplication. It's all God's work. We have no role to play but to wait and enjoy the harvest. So with that in our minds, I'm going to have you look back at chapter 4, and the Lord is going to give us four attitudes that we should maintain. The first is we, we are to approach evangelism humbly, humbly, because it's not in our power to change hearts. It's not in our power to change hearts. And that is proven in this parable starting in verse 3, parable of the sower and the soils. The, the sower goes out to sow in verse 3, and he, some of it falls on the road, beside the road. It's hard packed, and it doesn't penetrate at all, and the birds come and eat it up. Other soil is rocky soil, verse 5, and when seed falls on rocky soil, it can only go down a little bit because the soft dirt is only at the top and below is bedrock. Immediately it springs up because it has no depth of soil, so it looks responsive, but after the sun has arisen, it is scorched because it has no root. It can't penetrate to the water. It withers away. And then other seed fell among the thorns, verse 7. The thorns or the weeds come up and choke it, and it yields no crop. So you have three fruitless soils. And then you have the good soil in verse 8 that has fruit that is abnormally productive, 30, 60, 100-fold, and that's, that's shocking. That, that, those numbers are ridiculously beyond anything that would be expected. But the message here is the gospel has the power to do the things that are supernatural. The power of life transformed by God is far greater than we might expect. So our Lord says in verse 9, if you have ears, listen. Do you get it? Do you get what I'm just telling you? I know all of you don't. He explains that in verses 10 to 12. But to the disciples, verse 11, it's been given to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Those who are on the outside, they just get parables. And it obscures the things that the disciples understand. How do the disciples understand them? Because they have ears to hear and because the Lord explains them to them. And so in verse 13, he says to them, do you understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? In other words, this is the one that will help you to understand all the rest. So the Lord begins his explanation in verse 14. The sower sows the word. What is the seed? It is the word. It is the word. Who is the sower? Anybody who sows the word. Anybody who spreads the word. The seed is the Word of God. Luke 8, 11, the seed is the Word of God in the parallel passage in Luke. It is the gospel revelation. So it's pretty simple when you think about how the kingdom grows. It grows by the Word of God. Now, the third issue is obviously the soil, the soil. What are we talking about? What is this soil? In the parallel 
text of Matthew 13, it says, that which is sown in the heart. So the heart is the soil. So I have a sower, seed, and the heart. We have someone who proclaims the gospel, the gospel itself, and the heart. And there are several different kinds of heart conditions. First, there are fruitless heart conditions. And then there are fruitful heart conditions. The fruitless ones we see in verse 15. The ones who, the seeds that are sown beside the road, where the word is sown, when they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which was sown in them. This is if they, they hear the word, but it sits on the surface, easily snatched away by Satan who controls their lives with his lies. These are unresponsive people, callous people, hard people. This is the fool of Proverbs 1. This is the unplowed heart, the unprepared heart the indifferent heart, the hard heart, and nothing is going to happen. But secondly, there is the rocky heart in verse 16. The ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky place, and that means rock bed below the surface a little bit with just a surface amount of soil, sown there. These who have it sown on their rocky hearts, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. But they have no firm root in themselves. Because of the rock underneath the surface, the roots cannot penetrate to the water. So it's only very temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. And that's the kind of soil where you get a, an emotional response. And it, it looks like some life is there. And something comes up rather quickly. He defines it as joy. This is an immediate kind of emotional reaction to the fact that you now think all your problems are solved. I've been accepted. I now have God in my life. Everything's going to work out great. But when instead of everything working out great, because you're not really converted at all, things become difficult and there's pressure and even persecution for a professing Christian, you can't take it. And so you become part of the deconstructing crowd. But in contrast to that, experiences of genuine renewal by the Holy Spirit are God-centered. You come not saying, I want something for myself, but pounding on your chest saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I deserve nothing. Genuine experiences, genuine repentance. Genuine faith produces humility, Edward said. Humility, not pride. Meekness, not self-satisfaction. This is particularly true when the gospel is presented as if it was enough to move somebody's emotions. And in order to do that, they usually have to take out the hard parts of the gospel. So the person gets the promise of something that is going to give the, the sinner what the sinner already desires in his flesh. And it's explained in a totally inadequate way. And what does it do? It produces false conversions, which lead to deconstruction and hashtag ex-evangelicals. No, the Scripture says you, you have to be willing to do this, deny yourself. 
any man will come after me, let him deny himself. That's the starting point. Deny yourself. Not take up your prosperity, your riches, and all the blessings, but take up your cross. Lay your life down. This makes acceptance hard because it calls for self-denial, to hate your own self. It's hard to enter. The third fruitless soil our Lord lays out in verses 18 and 19, weeds. Seed is sown, they hear the Word, it looks like a response, but the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things enters in, chokes the Word, it becomes unfruitful. This is another pathway to deconstruction. This, this is not so much just the emotional issues that we saw in the second soil. This is the distractions of the age, the, the, the distractions of the world. It's dangerous, by the way, to import those distractions into the church and think that if you can bring the world into the church, you can gain a hearing from people and then transfer them to the kingdom. The problem is if you seduce them by the distractions that are already dominant in their hearts, you've done them no favor. You've legitimized the very things that they must abandon. No, the, the proof of real salvation is not a speedy re response in somebody saying, I feel happy now. Not temporary joy. No, it's when you have dug deep in your own heart and the repentance is real and you understand that salvation is not for your fulfillment but for God's glory. And when you turn your back on the flesh and the world. Edwards said, true conversion is marked by humble, broken-hearted love for God. So we can see in the soils that the disciples are being helped, and so are we, to understand that we sow the seed, the seed is the Word of God, the issue is the heart, we can't determine the heart, that is for God to do, not us. That's again back to the point that nobody comes unless the Father draws him, only God can plow the heart. We simply sow the seed, the results are determined by heaven. But then look at verse 20 in the good soil, quickly. There are those on whom seed was sown on the good soil, and they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. The good soil has to be prepared by the Lord. So the first thing we have to do in approaching the matter of advancing the kingdom is to do so humbly. Secondly, obediently, and these are very brief, obediently. What do you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is precisely what in verse 21 our Lord says. A lamp is not brought to be put under a basket, is it, or under a bed. Is it not brought to be put on the lamp stand? For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been secret but that it would come to light. Here's the second thing. You are to present the glory of the gospel obediently. You're to let your light shine. Get it out from under the basket, out from under the bed. Th that's the point. Th those things are absurdities. You don't put a lamp in a place where the light can't be seen. You put it where it can be seen. So this calls for obedience. Don't hide the message, reveal the message with boldness, obediently proclaiming, faithfully communicating the message. That's verses 21 and 22. And that is our second attitude. 
And it should be obvious that this is so clear that he adds in verse 23 again the reminder, are you listening? Did you get it? Did you hear? You do have ears to hear. Understand, you're supposed to make sure the message, the light is being seen. So we approach ministry in the advance of the kingdom humbly and obediently. Thirdly, diligently, diligently. Verse 24, and He was saying to them, take care what you listen to. Again, are you listening? He keeps saying that. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you, and more will be given you besides. Diligently. We are to, to be diligent because we know that our usefulness is proportionate to our obedience. Our reward is proportionate to our obedience. Look back at verse 24. It's this simple, folks. Take care to know this. You set the standard by which you will be measured. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. In other words, your eternal reward for advancing the kingdom will be in direct proportion to the level of your commitment. This is another truism. This is axiomatic. Usefulness in gospel ministry is proportionate to the seed sown. It's proportionate to the obedience. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, so sparingly reap sparingly. The more you sow, verse 24 says, the more will be given you besides. What do you mean? Your reward. Your reward will be given based upon the measure of your commitment. And if you're not going to be faithful to proclaim the gospel, the Lord will bring in His elect by means of someone else. But in verse 25, He even goes further and says, for whoever has, to him more shall be given. In other words, there's no limit. You've been faithful, you receive a reward. You be more faithful, you'll receive more reward, and more, and more, and more, unbounded. But on the other hand, whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. What is this referring to, whoever does not have? Well, Luke puts it this way, what he thinks he has shall be taken away. What does that mean? You remember Matthew 7? Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we did this, we did that in Your name. We proclaimed the truth. We did many wonderful works in Your name. And He says, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. If you're a true disciple and you're sowing the seed, in the measure that you sow, it will be measured back to you more and more and more and more. But there's another category of people, again, the fruitless, false disciples. Even though they spoke the gospel, even though they used the name of Christ, as Matthew 7 says, there is no reward for them. They may think they have a reward coming, but what they think they have will be removed. Only condemnation. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And it's true. You know, there are people who have come to Christ from a gospel message presented by a false Christian, false prophet, a fraudulent preacher. But there's no reward for the fakes, only condemnation. So we sow and we sleep. And we advance this, the gospel humbly, obediently, and diligently, and finally, confidently. It sounds a little bit daunting. Doesn't seem to be working out that well. 
But that's not the final picture. Go to verse 30. Here's the final picture. He said, how shall we picture the kingdom of God? Where's it going to end up? What's the final picture look like? By what parable shall we present it? How, how can I illustrate the end, the finale? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the soil, though it is smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. What is this saying? We sow and sleep humbly because we know that the results don't depend on us. We sow and we do so obediently because we know that there's an eternal reward for our faithfulness. We sow diligently. And here he says we sow confidently because we know that God has already determined a great outcome. You might not see it. You may not see it in your lifetime or in mine, but ultimately there's a great outcome. And he says, I can illustrate it this way, a mustard seed. That's the smallest seed that was actually planted. It could grow to a 15-foot tall bush, six feet wide, dense, thick, out of one tiny little seed, and strong enough basically to hold birds in it. That one little tiny seed looked like nothing. The final outcome was way out of proportion with the size of the mustard seed. It's essentially microscopic, but it can produce something that is huge. So understand this, that's where the kingdom's going. Christ will come. He will become King of kings and Lord of lords. He will rule over the whole world. Every knee will bow to Him. He will subdue every king, every potentate, every ruler, every president, prime minister. All will fall before Him, and He will establish His earthly kingdom where He reigns supreme and rules with a rod of iron over the whole world. And then He will create a new heaven and a new earth. To further your understanding of the essential lessons contained through the parables Christ told, order a copy of Pastor John's book, Parables, The Mysteries of God's Kingdom Revealed Through the Stories Jesus Told. This book is available by visiting our website, gty.org, or giving our operators a call at 888-57-GRACE.